So, yeah, hi Matthias. And hello everybody. We're gonna start the second chapter. Samia, um, nice to have you again. Um, I would request okay. you to go on mute. And, uh, you know, you can use that little green microphone and if you kind of click on it, it, it mutes. Um, oh no, you're, you're on mobile, so if you don't figure it out, I can mute you. And if you would like to ask a question, or so you can always use the chat. I, I don't know whether you're still familiar with it. It takes a while to get familiar with the, the thing on the phone. It's a little bit, a uh, little bit not as easy as joining on the laptop. But uh, once you know how to use it, you will figure out how to mute yourself. And okay, good. Now you can chat. That's good. So use the chat if you need to ask anything. Or you, if you figure out how to unmute yourself, you can unmute yourself. And just request uh, everybody that um, if you have background noise and you want to ask something, then use the chat. And if you don't have background noise, then you can always, you know, ask the question. All right. So we are starting the chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. The title of chapter two is Samkhya Yoga. So it is actually with chapter two that the real teachings of yoga start. In chapter one was a setting was created and a picture was created of a meditator, of a seeker who is, uh, is in a phase where he's beginning to doubt himself, where he is struggling with himself. And now the teacher actually begins to guide the meditator. The preparation has been done, but now come the real teachings. Now comes a phase of transformation. And so the title of the chap chapter two is Samkhya Yoga. And this is where really the teachings start, where Krishna starts explaining things to Arjun, who is in a very uh, desperate mood, in a very despondent mood, who doesn't quite understand what he should do. Chapter 2 contains the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. While we have said that the Bhagavad Gita itself is an essence of the Upanishadic teachings, chapter 2 is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita itself. Earlier, there was a tradition that when a person is dying, one read out the chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita to the dying person. This was very comforting and it helped the dying person to overcome his fear and gave some insights into the process of dying. So a very important chapter because it really is the essence of the entire Bhagavad Gita. And you can imagine the importance of this chapter since it's read to the dying person. I do not know really if this tradition is still being followed in India I have personally not experienced that myself, but that was the case earlier. And I think for those people who are um, spiritually inclined, they also would benefit a great deal from a daily reading of the Bhagavad Gita. Another tradition besides reading the Bhagavad Gita chapter 2 
to the dying person was the tradition of reading from the Bhagavad Gita every day. Also, this tradition has, you can say, basically died out, more or less. And uh, unfortunately, because um, a regular practice of reading a little bit every day from a spiritual text like the Bhagavad Gita is a very, very um, good practice and um, would support the meditative practice as well. Reading the Bhagavad Gita daily does not mean that you are doing a kind of a speed reading test for yourself. It's about contemplation. One can simply take one verse or a couple of verses, select a good commentary. If you find a good commentary, such as um, the commentary by Swami Rama, and just read a page or two. And not good anymore. Sorry? Uh, no, now the sound is back. It, it was interrupted for some time, but now I hear you again. Okay. So, um, oh, okay, what point did you all miss me? Oh, it was just a couple of sentences. Couple of sentences, okay, good. Um, as I was saying, the practice of reading from the Bhagavad Gita every day is a good practice to contemplate on a couple of verses and Traditionally, this was done in the mornings and it sort of carried you through the day. What is also nice perhaps for people uh, in modern life would be to read a page or two before you go to bed. A lot of people like to read a little bit before going to bed and so it is good to put in spiritual thoughts such as these in your mind before you go to bed because the mind works on these. The unconscious mind integrates these things in a way that the conscious mind cannot. So that would also be a very useful practice. So we start with the Samkhya Yoga, chapter 2, so Bhagavad Gita. The first verse, ah, Shanta, I'm so glad that you could join in. <clears throat> I was not sure if you figured that out, so I'm glad that worked out. Okay, verse 1. Sanjaya said, To him who was thus possessed with a pitiful mood, whose eyes were distressed and filled with tears, and who was suffering from sadness, the destroyer of Madhu. Sri Krishna addressed these words. So, we see that Sanjaya is describing Arjun once again, and he says, he was filled with a pitiful mood. His eyes were filled with tears. He was suffering from sadness. Well, this is the state of the mind of many a seeker. And in this state of mind, when a seeker comes to a teacher, he is um, looking for guidance. This is a good time for such a seeker to look for a teacher if he doesn't have one. Here the role of the teacher, Sri Krishna is in the role of a teacher, is a very very special role. We often think that teachers are somehow meant to be far away, we put our teachers on pedestals and some people have taken to guru worship and we find very often that this relationship, this kind of relationship, 
is not serving the student or the seeker. If you recall the times when you were in school, you might remember that some of the teachers that you really enjoyed learning from, the teachers that motivated you, the teachers that inspired you, were teachers that were not putting themselves on a pedestal, but who, who, who really were able to communicate with you. They were talking to you and they were very positive, friendly, loving. And these are the qualities of a teacher, a person who empathizes with your suffering, who can come down from his heights and go to the level of the student who is lost in these emotions, the coloring of the glaciers, who is basically lost in avidya or maya. When such a teacher is available, he is a friend, he is a mentor, he is a guide. Such a teacher can really help you on the path. You see the word mentor, you know, it is used very often in management circles. And the word mentor is used quite naturally. One doesn't think about it too much. And it's not suspect. Very often the word guru is suspect. A lot of people begin to think of guru as, oh, he's somebody who's going to take control of you. Somebody who is going to, uh, you know, somehow has evil intentions. And there are so, a lot of associations of gurus with cults, with money, and these kind of things, which makes us very afraid, very wary of such words. But the word mentor has still a very positive meaning. And it is used in modern society a lot, especially in management circles. It's totally accepted that one cannot really succeed without a mentor in management, in careers. So what is true in management or in any other industry or branch, academics for example, is also true in the spiritual world. Yet for many people, it seems they are very afraid of having a guru or a teacher. They think that they can learn just from books and they shy away from the idea of having a teacher or a guru. They want to have many, many teachers and they learn from a lot of teachers, but the learning is more at an information level and it remains then very superficial. But having a mentor or a guru means learning something at a deeper level. It means really how to integrate these ideas into your daily life. The word mentor, by the way, you might be surprised, comes from the same root from Sanskrit as mantra, as mind, as mantri. For some of you may know mantri is minister. The, in, the Prime Minister of India is called Pradhan Mantri. The chief, the, you know, the main minister of the king would be called Pradhan Mantri. The main minister, the, the first minister, so to say. And the word mantri comes from the same root as mind or mantra. And it means somebody who counsels you. In our tradition, we call the teacher or the mentor also a revered friend. It implies that the teacher is not somehow higher 
than the seeker. He's not put himself on a pedestal. He doesn't want to be worshipped. He's at the same level as you. There is a certain equality. There is a friendship. There is a relationship which is reciprocal. This relationship does not just develop overnight. It takes a long time to develop this relationship. So we do need to be patient. We need to develop trust. We need to spend time with each other. There are a lot of students, some of them who have come to me and said, I'm the student of Yoganand. Swami Yoganand, I said, hmm, how is that possible? He, he's left his body uh, a long time ago. And you don't seem to be that old. So it's a little bit amusing sometimes when I hear that. And they say, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm the student of Swami Yoganand, but I never met him, but I've read all his books. Well, that's not quite what is meant by being a part of a lineage or having a teacher. Having a revered friend, meaning somebody you spend time with, somebody you talk to, somebody you share with. And this person guides you. It may be very simple matters, but it's these simple matters that help us integrate these ideas into our life. Without this, all these beautiful philosophical ideas remain purely at a theoretical level, at an intellectual level. And that which remains at this intellectual level and does not go to the unconscious level, cannot transform us. It remains at the surface. So a revered friend is what we need. It's not a friend like a buddy, you know, whom you do all um, kind of silly things with. The element of respect is very important. And of course, trust. And so of course, this takes time to develop. The relationship does not develop overnight. So Sri Krishna here is now in his role, he is stepping into his role of the mentor, the guide, the counselor, the revered friend. Would anybody like to ask anything about this before I continue to the next verse? Uh, one question came in my mind, Nandikaji. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how I feel Swami Rama is a guru, mm -hmm. uh, but I cannot call him a river friend according to this definition because right. I have not seen him in physical body. Yes. But still he is my guru, yes? Um, <clears throat> we have two definitions of guru. One is the external guru and the other is internal guru. So the external guru is your revered friend, your guide, whom you would whose guidance you take for your daily life. And internal guru is that wisdom within you. Now, you may consider Swami Rama as guru because we have many teachers. We learn in different ways. That's, there are upagurus, that means we learn from many gurus. And these upagurus, they all contribute to our development. Your mother, the mother, is the very first guru. She's the one who gives you this body. Through her, you get this body. The father is also one of the teachers. Through him, also you learn. So, we have other teachers as well. And so, we learn from different teachers. They're all called gurus. We are aware, for example, that in India, it is totally normal if you go to a dance class or you learn some vocals, you call the teacher there also guru. Guru also means simply teacher. We have raised in the spiritual world the word guru to something very, very uh, full of reverence. 
which we don't accord that same reverence maybe to our school teacher. But these are also gurus, these are also teachers. But to, to say very simple and straightforward, having that revered friend is what helps transform you. Having a teacher that you have never met, like for example, I said Yogananda. A lot of people say my teacher is from Yogananda. I meet a lot of people who say Raman Maharishi is my teacher. And I say, well, you could not have met him. No, we have not met him, but we have read all his books. And we have been to, to Raman Ashram in, uh, you know, in South India. And that is not what is meant by Guru. You may be inspired by many teachers. And they are gurus in the sense of Upaguru. But they are not gurus in the sense of your revered friend, your mentor, your guide. Because through books, through, through inspiration that one learns, for example, the books of Swami Rama, the books of uh, Swami Vivekananda, they have inspired many people. So these are, of course, wonderful teachings and these are great teachers. So this is, this is very nice. Yet the role of the mentor, the counsel, the, the friend is very important because without this, there is a great danger that the, the teachings remain purely at an intellectual level. There's a great danger that we do not really transform and even worse still, that these teachings puff us up and create an ego in us. It's a big danger. And it's the job of this revered friend to see that we understand the teachings with the right attitude and we integrate these in our life. This revered friend is like your mirror and the revered friend may say and make you aware of things that you may not really want to. Sometimes you have to swallow some bitter pills. Medicine is bitter, but it's very good for you. You can always have, you know, sweets and chocolates and they are very pleasant, but they're not necessarily good. And that's the role of the teacher. And as we continue this, you will see how Sri Krishna develops this role and tells Arjun things that he does not really want to hear. Radhika? Yes, uh, I, Scott. I think uh, something, another word, since we are talking about Swami Rama's books, uh, yeah. so many of us that uh, you know, read his books and also watch the videos uh, yeah. that are available, things, yeah. the, he uses, often uses the word my master. Yeah. So I think it's probably worth touching on that as well, isn't it? Um, how that relates to the you know guru and teacher. Yes. He, um, I guess he picked up that uh, he says master because he is talking. Um, all the books uh, come out of his lectures that he um, gave when he was in the United States in the 70s and 80s. And... He, of course, used the word master or master um, uh, for the American audience, for a Western audience. And there he was actually translating, I presume almost literally, the word Swami, which also means master. Swami is master of the self. So a kind of honorific for his uh, close friend, Bengali Baba, who uh, was his teacher with whom he spent many, many years and who raised him like a son, almost like a son. So that was a, an interesting relationship which uh, is well uh, described and in, described in great detail in Living with the Himalayan Masters where uh, we see very often the conflicts <laughs> between uh, Bengali Baba and Swami Rama that Bengali Baba could be very, very firm. And uh, the young Swami Rama was very often immature 
and uh, almost uh, foolish and the quite different from the master that some of us know him to be and um, that did not happen overnight that took years of development years of transformation years of practice and a very important role was played of course by Bangali Baba in guiding him had it all been just theoretical book knowledge had he just spent his time reading books it might have been quite different so there is a great great emphasis put on having a revered friend having the direct access to a teacher who corrects us who guides us who encourages us who who strengthens our positive qualities who makes us aware of our weaknesses this is something that most of us as adults living in a modern society don't really want we have sort of grown in this modern society to believe that you know we are so educated we have so many degrees we are so successful we we get some fancy titles working in big companies and all this puffs up our ego and it requires a great deal of humility to go to a teacher a revered friend and say you know i need help i really cannot do this on my own can you help me and therefore there's a need for a student to acknowledge first and foremost that he needs guidance if you don't come to that point in your life where you acknowledge that you need guidance then you do not get such a level trend you have to be open to, open to having such a teacher if you're not open then what happens is a lot of students spend their time reading books reading you know websites and uh, which is also useful at some level but at some point of time we need to go a little bit deeper all right i wanted to just uh, mention something on what i observed the difference when uh, i hear indians they say with much more ease i have a guru with the western folks including myself at the beginning it was much more a challenge to acknowledge that and uh, even in uh, in india if you tell somebody i have a guru then yeah that's great if i do this in the west then people I mean they don't say what is that but i can feel this they are not really familiar with this with this concept mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, understand that completely. It's a cultural thing, of course, and so a way out of that is to use the word mentor, maybe, instead of using the word guru. Yeah. The word guru is, as I said, a bit tainted in the West especially. But just to add to that, Yohim, the word guru also in India, among a lot of modern Indians, is also a bit suspect. a lot of modern indians also are uncomfortable with this idea and so that is not just uh, something in the west and um and the other side of the coin is that for many indians who do have gurus it becomes the putting teacher on pedestal version you know the guru worship which uh, does not necessarily uh, is not necessarily useful it can be inspiring and it it creates some very positive uh, impressions yet yeah. the the relationship that krishna and arjun have is of friendship they were friends it says that throughout the bhagavad gita throughout the mahabharat they were friends it doesn't say krishna was the teacher and arjun was his student it says always they were good friends mm. and um, that's the uniqueness of 
this relationship and as well as in our tradition a great deal of emphasis put on this idea of a revered friend for speedy no, development very, I would say. It's a very beautiful institution which is there. Yes. It's for and those who I want speedy want development. Uh, so, so, <laughs> sorry, we are speaking simultaneously. Sometimes, um, you know, I see the, the Westerners, you know, they run away from the church that they are connected to and then mm. suddenly they, they, uh, they put uh, Shiva on their desk and uh, mm. all the Indian goddesses yeah. um, is replaced by, by Jesus or by um, the Catholic or the, the church belief. Yes. Um, but hardly I see anybody going into this um, revert friend relationship there. Yeah. That's yes. Sad. Yes, because as I said, it takes a, a lot of humility uh, to accept that you do need guidance. So it's much more convenient to read books and. Uh, to, to say I have many teachers and this is my teacher and that is my teacher and there are a lot of teachers. So it is very convenient to say that, it's very easy to say that. But to go through a process where you are uh, having to work uh, on yourself with uh, somebody telling you all the time that there are certain parts in you that you need to look at, you need to work here at this level, you need to uh, um, change this in your life. You know, that, that's uh, not necessarily what people want. So the idea of a revered friend is for those who want speedy development. It is for the adhikari, for the qualified student who is transforming um, at an unconscious level not merely at some reading intellectual books level, but wanting to really transform from within. Yeah. Okay. So, um, verse two, verses two and three. The blessed Lord said, from where has this ignominy favored of the ignoble, unheavenly, and disreputable entered you at such a troublesome time, O Arjuna. Do not lapse into impotency, O son of Pritha. It does not well behoove you. Abandon this littleness and weakness of the heart and rise, O scorcher of enemies. So one of the first things that such a revered friend would do when a meditator, a seeker, is full of doubts, who is, who is hesitating, and not only hesitating, remember that I have mentioned this, that during the process of meditation, unacceptable qualities come forward, the negative qualities come forward, now the Kauravas come forward, are getting active, these are the kleshas getting active and as you meditate and you see these unpleasant qualities in you, you get disturbed and because you are disturbed, you want to escape from this and you may end up saying something like, meditation is dangerous, I don't want to continue because I'm I see all these bad things in myself. I'm a bad person. And that is a point where you would stop developing, you would go backwards, you say, no, I don't want to do this. And so, Sri Krishna, he encourages Arjuna and says, why have you become so full of doubts? Why have you become so weak? So he says, don't become important, don't become so weak. It doesn't suit you, you're a great warrior. So one who really meditates, who's sitting there day after day at his seat, looking at himself, at his unpleasant qualities, as well as some pleasant qualities, looking at 
things like his own egoism, looking at his attachments, looking at his aversion, looking at his fears, looking at his greed, his anger, his sadness, his pain, his pride. Now you can imagine that when you are sitting day after day in meditation and this is what comes forward, at some point of time you begin maybe to lose courage and you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is this right? Maybe this is dangerous. Especially when the society all around you is telling you, what is this that you're doing? Why are you wasting your time? Just go enjoy yourself. And so you need somebody who motivates you, somebody who encourages you. It's very hard to be on this path, you know, the, the lonely, you know, single fighter always fighting lonely battles. We need satsang as well. That's why we put such an emphasis on satsang that we do this together. We learn from each other, we support each other. And of course, a revered teacher, a revered friend is one who has done this before. If he hasn't done this before and he is merely or she is merely talking out of books, that person cannot guide you much. It's, then it says in the Upanishads, that is the case of the blind leading the blind. You know, you're ignorant and your teacher is also ignorant because the only thing you have done is read books. So such a teacher cannot help you much. Obviously, the teacher you need, the mentor, the revered friend we are talking about is one who has walked this path before. He has meditated. He has gone through this process of looking at the unhealthy qualities within. He has dealt with his negative emotions of greed, anger, pride. He has dealt with his attachments and aversions. He knows their power. He knows how difficult it is to deal with these and how much doubt they bring, how they can cover you with like a veil of darkness. And when you are in those moments feeling your fears or your attachments or your anger, you lose your completely your sense of detachment or discrimination. And it is only such a guide who can help another. And what he does is motivate you, help you become stronger, take you to your own inner Sankalp Shakti. We cannot borrow continuously the energy from our teacher, even from our revered friend. Ultimately, we need to find our own strength within, Sankalp Shakti that is within. But until we are so strong, we have a little we need a little guidance from outside. Often we use the example of a little sapling, a little plant, which is growing, but because it is weak, there's a danger that, you know, some cows, buffaloes, or elephants are just going to pull it out. Some people will trample on it. So you put a little fence around it in order to protect it. But that fence is only a temporary thing. It's not permanent. Once the tree is, once the plant is strong enough, it's become not a full grown tree, but it's strong enough. No uh, buffaloes and cows or animals can just eat it up or trample on it. Then you can remove the fence. So until that time that you find your inner teacher until your buddhi is sharp enough you have your revered friend you have a mentor who guides you
so the word guru um, just to mention what uh, swarnalata is uh, mentioned in the chat the word guru um, is referred to as one who dispels darkness now just to clarify on that word guru if you read books they often talk about this guru is you know uh, one is darkness and who is leading us to light and the fact is that if you look at any really good sanskrit dictionary you will find that guru has many meanings means teacher of course but guru also means a pregnant woman is guru the planet jupiter is guru guru also means heavy guru also means gravity so there are many meanings of the word guru it is not a coincidence that guru means gravity gravity is a force of attraction heavy no gravity gravity is heavy it pulls you the planet jupiter is the heaviest planet in the solar system it's the brightest object in the sky venus and jupiter are the brightest objects in the sky so guru is one who attracts you draws you towards him the idea of guru being a dispeller of darkness doesn't come from literal sanskrit meaning it is coming from an interpretation of those who go deeper into meditation and they see that guru within it brings you to knowledge that light is knowledge and so that's an understanding of guru is when we go within you experience in the external level an attraction towards certain teachers and not feeling so attracted maybe to other teachers and internally guru is that within you which guides you that voice which guides you so these two verses also indicate the importance of sankalp shakti the need for this revered friend outside who in the early stages will provide you with that sankalp shakti encourage you and eventually lead you to not only the guru within but also lead you to that sankalp shakti um which is uh, within you as well okay so we go to chapter sorry verse 4 So I would request all of you uh, please do not write me private messages when uh, we are reading um I cannot answer them and they also distract me from the session when you are in a classroom you can't have a private conversation with your teacher right so um I would request you not to write me private messages So verse four. Now Arjun responds. Arjun responds with, "O oh Lord Krishna, how can I fight back with arrows against Bhishma and Drona in the battle? They are both worthy of my honor and respect. O oh destroyer of enemies."
So what is happening here? Now we spoke about this earlier that Bhishma and Drona were also Arjun's teachers. When Arjun was young, he first learned from Bhishma. He learned archery from Bhishma. And when Bhishma had taught them as much as he could, he looked for a good teacher and he found the good teacher in Drona. And so both Bhishma and Drona are his teachers. And obviously, he is a very respectful of them and he is at the same time in great doubt because he does not want to fight against these teachers. This brings us to the idea that we talked about just slightly earlier, having external teachers, a revered friend, gurus, and I mentioned that most people, especially these days, modern times, have a lot of teachers. We're reading a lot of different books from different traditions. We're looking at a lot of websites, many scholarly websites, maybe other websites from different traditions. Today, there are also many large organizations that are active everywhere. There are a lot of videos available and people are also watching these. So, we have a respect for a lot of these teachers. And some of these teachers are also our role models. Think back to the time when you were a child and you had a teacher, whether the teacher was teaching you a language or math or, or art or sports, whatever it was, when you were a child, obviously the teacher was better than you. But it may have happened that as you have grown up, and you have acquired a great many degrees and skills, perhaps you are now better than your teacher. You have a better understanding maybe of the languages. Maybe you have a better understanding of math than your school teacher. Right? So as we develop, it may happen that certain role models certain teachers are no longer necessary. We need to see that we do not believe everything blindly what these teachers tell us. After all, many of these teachers are also just human beings, just normal people. So, they also are growing and developing. So we should not accept everything they say blindly. We're talking about blind faith versus reasoned faith. Finally, you have to use your own sense of discrimination which is known as buddhi. When that happens, that your buddhi gets active, sharpened, you have acquired now a sense of discrimination, then you can question your teacher, ask for explanations, but if it does not agree with buddhi, with your conscience, then you cannot do that. In the Second World War, for example, after the war was over, many people who worked in concentration camps were tried um, and um, in court they all said, oh, we had no choice, we got orders and we had to follow the orders, we had no choice. We, we didn't do anything, we, we couldn't help it. it. We just had to do our duty. Orders were orders, that was what they said. This argumentation was not accepted by these courts who said that 
there is something like higher conscience. Conscience is different from consciousness. Consciousness is Atman. Consciousness, is, there are many words for consciousness. One of them is, of course, Atman, Prana. But conscience is an English word that is the best word perhaps we can use for buddhi. It's that voice in which in you that tells you whether you should do something or not do something. It's that voice which says, this is not right, don't do it. So conscience is what is the highest. And those people that were tried there for the work they did in the concentration camps the court said, we do not accept your argumentation. You did not follow your conscience. You knew it was wrong, but you did. We often talk um, in countries where there are evil dictators, there are people who are put in prison because they refuse to do what the dictators tell them. They are called prisoners of conscience because they are following their conscience. So, a true seeker ultimately listens to his conscience. Since there are so many external teachers available, so many different traditions, when we do have a teacher, finally, we do need to follow our conscience ultimately, use our discrimination, and not blindly follow things. Like this. Raigaji, yes, Ashish. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions I had. Uh, one is obviously being clear about what is the voice of conscience and mm -hmm. what is the voice of ego, because the ego can pretend to be right. the voice of conscience. Yes. And the second thing was about, you know, there, there are a lot of these personas in Mahabharat, like Bhishma and Drona, mm -hmm. who were teachers and who were apparently, you know, good guys, kind of, mm -hmm. but ultimately who were on the side of the opposite army. Right. So, given that, like, Mahabharat is a symbolic uh, story about yeah. the seeker's mind, yeah. what do these figures represent internally? Well, for the first part, um, yes, about ego and buddhi. Of course, ego can has a big role to play in a seeker whose mind is not purified, who is not prepared. They will have a problem because they might reject a real good teacher and might follow uh, the wrong path. Here, of course, when we are talking about following Buddhi, we are talking about Arjun, who has been prepared. He's a well-prepared student. So when we talk about preparation in our own terms here, it means you do your practice. It means that if you don't have a teacher, stay where you are. You don't have to run all over the world. Pray for guidance. And when the desire in you, the desire for guidance is really strong, from somewhere a teacher appears. And we all know this phrase, uh, when seeker is ready, the, the teacher appears. And I have found that to be true. And I know people who have also found it to be true. That, that when that desire is in you, you will get the guidance. So... It may happen for the mind that's not prepared that the ego, of course, takes over and you end up in a situation where uh, you're really on the wrong path. But if you haven't purified your mind, first what you need is to stay where you are, do what you know with the right attitude. If you already have a purified mind, then follow your buddhi. That's what it's saying here. You're, for those who are on the path and 
who are still struggling, you know, with the ego, with buddhi, there's, you're sort of in between, in a transition phase. It's an ongoing process. There is no, you know, quick fix for this. It's a very long journey of working on oneself, transforming oneself. And that's why we do need our external guide. We do need somebody who has been on this path before. And uh, the second part of your question was about uh, the, symbolic, the symbolism of uh, characters who are on the other side, such as, of course, Bhishma and Rona. This is, I have, we have mentioned this earlier, in one of the earlier sessions, that Bhishma had a conflict. He had sworn himself to the throne of Hastinapura. And Dhritarashtra, the blind king, symbolizing ignorance, is, uh, is, is the king. What this means is that our body is the kingdom. And when ignorance rules here, then there's going to be all sorts of battles which will take place. And these battles play out in the mind. For those of us who practice internal dialogue, may especially experience this internal battle. And they will find that there are aspects in themselves that they thought were good earlier, and they turn out to be not so good eventually. It's a process of developing in each, each level. As you keep developing, you will see yourself unlearning things, you know, certain ideas that we thought were good. For example, for, for many of us, we thought it was good to uh, earn lots of money, to have good, you know, um, jobs, titles, and uh, be ambitious. These are ideas that are promoted in modern society. Be ambitious, you know, competition is good. All these ideas, be successful, whatever the cost. And then suddenly, as we grow and develop over a period of time, your buddhi sharpens purely out of your own experience, maybe due to suffering, pain, um, in your relationships, uh, being sometimes at the receiving end <laughs> of, that, uh, of those ideas. And suddenly you realize, hmm, maybe it's not so good. Always this competition you know, whatever the cost may be, and your attitude changes. So what was good, you know, in inverted commas, is now perhaps not so good. And so these indicate our continuous development. So external teachers as Bhishma, Drona, good as they were for that point of time, they indicate further growth which is why we say we need to always final judge in the matter is buddhi. And if the mind is not purified, if the buddhi is not sharp enough, you will make mistakes, but that's okay. It's a process of growing. It's a process of learning to sharpen buddhi. If you don't ever make mistakes, you're probably never going to develop, you know? As the saying goes, you need to make mistakes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, our one hour session is already over, and um, it's probably a good place to stop and not move on to the next verse. So, if you, if anybody has any other questions. We can go ahead. If there is nothing more that anybody wants to add, then we can stop our session here. I just have one thing. Yes. So in this uh, in this continuous progress, mm -hmm. there there probably will be there might come a stage where you are aware, aware of more bad than you know. You were under an illusion that these things were okay. Yeah. And suddenly, when all of these bad stuff in you become more evident, mm -hmm. it might look like, or it, it, yeah, at that moment at least, it feels like you have become.
become how to say you were a better person before or something like that and although on one level you know that this is still progress you're you're no longer in delusion but the feeling is what it is so uh, is there something to do at this point where you're not feeling so confident of yourself because so much of this good stuff have started appearing bad or started revealing themselves yeah well that's a, that's a positive sign that's a sign of development and um, that just reminds us that there may be things right now that you think is good <laughs> that might some years down the line you might say hmm i spent so much time just looking at videos and books and acquiring intellectual knowledge and that may be at some level good but you might begin to see that differently and say hmm that had its use but it's no longer useful i have moved on from that it's like a child not playing with you know cars or dolls or, or or cuddly toys and when the person is a teenager i says oh my god i don't want to be caught dead with with a cuddly toy you know how embarrassing for a teenager to be caught with a cuddly toy it's the most embarrassing thing that can happen to a teenager right that's a process of development you might even go to the other side and have an aversion and so very often we see that in you know spiritual seekers you know we tend to condemn people who are worldly and say oh all these worldly people all these materialistic people and that's because we have come out of that and we see that as you know not good anymore but as we develop to a still higher level you might say hmm the fact that i condemned them at that point of time was perhaps also not very nice so it's a continuous ongoing process of uncoloring glaciers of the veil of avidya of maya raising you know there are many many layers of of this veil and one by one we keep lifting it's a fascinating process it's great fun and um it's always nice to look back a couple of years down some of you might keep diaries or so and if you read them later and you say hey i wrote that how 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 silly it sounds now you know so that's um it's an interesting process yeah, thanks good so it was nice having all of you here and um have a nice weekend everybody some of us will be together again around the same at the same time on sunday for mastering pranayam and um yeah Oh, Radhika ji, just one thing. Yes. Ah, uh, this Rona symbolizes attachment or ego. Well, it's not possible to put labels on on just you know different characters, um, because the teachings, ah, uh, the symbolism, is at many many different levels, and so we need to contemplate on these things, and okay, you know. understand them that there are many many layers of these and so i would be not very comfortable to just put a little label and say oh drona is ego or drona is you know something for our purposes um through our tradition see drona is an external teacher who's preparing you there like many other teachers that we all have who prepare us he is not the internal guru he is not the guru within that is krishna Krishna represents that guru within. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank, thank you everybody. Uh thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Yeah. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye everyone. Thank you Radhika. Bye bye Aranka. Bye. Namaste everyone. Bye bye Nikhilaj. Bye Himashri. Bye Anju.